Good afternoon. Welcome to today's seminar. Our guest speaker, a real honor and pleasure to have Max McGillan visiting with us all the way from University of Bristol. And uh, let's see, Max got his PhD at Manchester. He has then done some postdoc and research fellow uh, positions at first continued work at Manchester. He did a handful of years here at the NOAA Aronomy Lab, where many of us got to know him. He's also been at Leicester for a short time and is now a distinguished Marie Curie Research Fellow at the University of Bristol. Uh, Max's work, I won't go into all the details, but is focused on chemical kinetics, reaction mechanisms of atmospheric processes. And I think he's had a real um, sort of bent towards looking at predictive, development of predictive rules for these types of processes. So with that, I'll uh, turn things over to Max. The title of his talk is Comprehensive Laboratory Studies of Hydrocarbon Oxidation Mechanisms. Max. All right, are we on? Hi there, so uh, thanks for coming everybody. And um, thanks for the invite. Um, so you can see from my list of sponsors here that I haven't been in uh, Boulder for the first time. Um, so this could be a case of Chief Niwot's curse playing out in front of our eyes at the moment. Um, so I've chosen this curtain motif as uh, my title slide, which sort of shows the general mysterious uh, chemical mechanisms that operate on the chemistry of our VOCs. And, um, and how really uh, we don't know a ton about this kind of stuff and it's my job to, um, to uncover some of those details. Right, so I'm going to begin with a brief, a brief outline of uh, the motivation for this work. Then I'm going to talk about the mechanisms by which VOCs are processed in the atmosphere in some general terms. So I'll just go through a little bit of atmospheric chemistry for you. Then I'm going to talk about some temperature dependent product studies that we conducted as uh, part of my work with uh, Jeff and John here on the, uh, the biofuel known as isobutanol. And then I'll talk about a uh, global site specific uh, fitting method that takes all the available kinetic data and it turns it into one neat parameterization that you can use to predict the behavior of this compound throughout the entire tropospheric temperature range. Um, I found through experience that this was a, a difficult thing to do. Um, so I will talk a little bit about the, uh, the various um, difficulties associated with chamber work in general. It's not perfect. And then um, I'll also uh, proceed to talk about a, uh, a new venture that I've got going on, which is this, uh, this project, HOMA, which is a European funded project to uh, elucidate hydrocarbon oxidation mechanisms. So to begin with, atmospheric chemistry is a dangerous thing and it's basically killing us all. So um, poor air quality is affecting um, many people's lives today. Um, PM 2.5 alone has been estimated to uh, be responsible for 3.3 million deaths globally um, each year. And I think this is just a fascinating statistic. As, as depressing as it is, it's fascinating because if you, to put this into context, about 6 million people die each year due to smoking tobacco. And we know this is bad for us. More than half of the people um, actually die through, uh, through things um, that aren't a negative lifestyle choice or anything like that. It's just simply by virtue of the fact that they live in a polluted environment. And so I think this is actually a major problem. And the second uh, interesting thing about the statistic is it could actually be the tip of the iceberg. So things could get a lot worse in the future. Um, We've got increased urbanization happening. We've got increased demands on agricultural, energy, and transport sectors. So you've basically got more people um, at the source of the pollution. So that 3.3 million number might get a lot larger. 
soon enough. Um, and then you've got the fact that you do have a, an economic burden associated with this kind of pollution. And it's been estimated that in Brussels, um, people live on average about seven months uh, shorter than you know somebody living in a less polluted environment, which basically means that um, you know uh, this is affecting just people in in all sorts of population centres. Um, but then, if you take the economics of risk uh, aversion, then that's about fifty billion euros. Um, a year alone, just due to PM 2.5. So if you scale up that estimate to include other parts of Europe and also other pollutants such as pan, ozone, NOx, that kind of stuff, then it seems reasonable to assume that a price tag is more in excess of a trillion euros a year, which um, if you're not used to thinking in terms of euros, then at current exchange rates, that's about one to one on the dollar at the moment. So there you go. Um, and yet, despite the fact that we, we have this terrible problem, um, there are some fundamental aspects of atmospheric chemistry that we are yet to understand. So as an atmospheric chemist, this is like one of my favorite diagrams. I always like looking at this thing. Um, you basically have this autocatalytic production of ozone in the troposphere. So you start off with an OH radical that reacts with a VOC. This makes an alkyl radical round about here, and it adds an oxygen to give you a peroxy radical. That peroxy radical here can do an NO to NO2 conversion, yielding an alkoxy radical, which reacts really efficiently with O2 to give you a carbonyl and HO2. This HO2, just like the other peroxy radical, does an NO to NO2 conversion, yielding OH back which is ready to hit another unsuspecting VOC. And so basically, you've got this mechanism by which you're making plenty of NOx, or plenty of NO2 rather, and plenty of ozone. And this is a really succinct um, summary of what atmospheric, uh, of what tropospheric chemistry is all about. Um, the trouble is that it's a gross generalization. And it all depends on this. Uh, this organic moiety, this alkyl fragment. What is the identity of R? So depending on the identity of R, you could get some very different things happening with your alkoxy radicals. So you've got these, um, these fragmentation pathways. You could have multiple fragmentation pathways, all from one uh, alkoxy radical. You could have this thing survive long enough that it reacts with O2 to give you a carbonyl which is fine, and then you could also have uh, isomerization, which gives you one of these interesting uh, radical alcohol species. So depending on the identity of R, your, uh, your radicals, specifically your peroxies and your alkoxy radicals, could start to participate in the, um, in the odd nitrogen cycle. And I don't really want to go into all the details of the odd nitrogen cycle. I've just put it up here to show you that it's complicated, really. Um, but there are um, various organic components. So these, uh, these things that are highlighted in the uh, blue ellipses here are essentially uh, organic components to the odd nitrogen cycle. And these things can be stable reservoirs of NOx and things like that. And they could be more or less stable, all depending on what R is. So also depending on R, you could get some interesting uh, peroxy radical chemistry. So you've got some of these uh, recently discovered um, auto-oxidation mechanisms that could start to yield some fairly, um, fairly involatile species all in one oxidation step. So RO2 can actually shift hydrogens around in uh, not so polluted circumstances. And you can start to build up this very oxidized molecule that could, in principle, go from being very volatile species over here to a very, uh, very involatile species by the end of its oxidation cycle, all in one oxidation step. And finally, uh, depending on R, um, you could get many different and possibly quite unpredictable interactions of the peroxy radicals that could give you a fairly poorly constrained uh, suite of products.
So I'm going to focus this talk down a little bit and talk about this, uh, this compound called isobutanol, which is an example of a VOC that is um, likely to increase in the future. So its mixing ratio should be going up. So butanols in general are proposed to be a drop-in replacement for, um, for conventional gasoline and diesel blends. And what I mean by drop-in is that they share many of the same physical characteristics of, um, of standard gasoline formulations. So you should be able to put this into your car without too much uh, modification to the engine or the, um, or the supply infrastructure. Um, it's readily produced, so we make it without drying in this acetone butanol ethanol fermentation process that yields butanol about 60% of the time. Um, there are a few advantages over conventional biofuels such as bioethanol. So one is that um, you can basically carry more energy around with you since it has a higher energy density. And another is that it's less hydrophilic, so it takes on water less effectively, which is better for, um, for your car, apparently. Um, you've got this whole congressional mandate that, um, that stipulates that you need to have 36 billion gallons of biofuel by the year 2022. And yet, um, corn-based ethanol is, uh, is being capped at 15 billion gallons. So that basically means that you got a bit of a shortfall and you need to shore that up with a supply of either a less conventional fuel or to make your ethanol from another source. But essentially it does uh, pave the way for different fuels to come into the market. Uh, and also the fact is that with widespread usage, um, widespread release is inevitable. So you're basically going to be dumping a whole lot of ibutanol into the atmosphere if you start using it. I've got a couple of um, examples on the right here which show um, how our choice of fuel is actually impacting the environment. So I've got this one example at the top left which is um, a time series of the benzene acetylene ratio going from about 1970 to about 2005. What you can see from this graph is that it steadily is increasing up to about 1992. And then you see this inflection, it starts to drop off and that's where the US decided it, it wasn't really a bright idea to add benzene to the, um, to the gas formulation which is uh, because it's a recognized carcinogen. Um, so I've got another different type of graph down here, which is a, uh, this is ground level ozone on the y-axis versus the percentage share of uh, gasoline in vehicles. And this is in Rio de Janeiro where you've got these flexi fuel vehicles. And basically the take home message from this graph is that gasoline cars uh, produce more NOx and so they titrate out ozone eventually and uh, you've got this nice negative correlation that's exhibited when people, when the market price of gasoline goes down to such a price that uh, people are using it in a more pure form in their flexi-fuel vehicles. So you've got this really clear linkage between our choice of fuel and, uh, and what our atmospheric chemistry is doing. So what does ibutanol do? How does it react with OH? Well. First of all, it does react with OH, like most things. Um, it's a straight up uh, hydrogen abstraction reaction. So here's our alkane, reacts with OH, gives you an alkyl radical plus water as a co-product. Um, you've got four different types of hydrogen sites here. You've got six equivalent primary hydrogens. You've got one tertiary hydrogen here, two secondary hydrogens, and one hydroxyl hydrogen. This alpha, beta, gamma um, nomenclature refers to the, uh, to the distance away from the double bond, which, sorry, from the OH group, which is um, one, two, and three carbon atoms uh, respectively. And so all of, these, uh, all of these sites contribute, of course, to the total reactivity of the molecule. So the total reactivity is actually the sum of all their partial contributions. And so if you compare the reactivity of this alcohol with its alkane um, counterpart, then you can see that it's a lot more reactive. So it's about a factor of five more reactive than isobutane. 
And so the question is, what's going on? What is the influence of this, uh, this alcohol side? And the answer to that is that you've got these pre-reactive complexes that can form when, uh, when an alcohol is present in the molecule. So these actually facilitate um, these hydrogen-bonded hydrogen complexes, which can facilitate a reaction either by tunneling or by suppressing the, um, the activation energy. And so these can, uh, these can make this alcohol surprisingly reactive. Should be uh, important to, to note that this is uh, at room temperature. These things do tend to change at different temperatures, which is why we do temperature-dependent kinetics. So you've basically got these uh, competing reaction mechanisms. Uh, on the one hand, you've got these pre-reactive complex mediated reactions that, uh, that lead, to, um, lead to your products. This is, uh, this is giving thermally unstable adducts, which, uh, which can reform reactants. So unless it's cold, essentially, these things are going to fall apart. So that leads to a negative temperature dependence. So as temperature goes down, reactivity goes up. And these tend to be more important in the atmospheric chemistry uh, kind of range, in that temperature range. So on the other hand, you've got these primary processes that go on. We've got a direct channel to abstracting a hydrogen. These tend to have a higher activation energy, so they've got a positive temperature dependence. They're less reactive in general, and um, it tends to be more important for combustion chemistry. And this, this is that same argument in pictorial form. This is an Arrhenius diagram, so it's a uh, log of uh, the rate coefficient on the y-axis versus your inverse temperature on the x-axis. As you can see, this complex is not doing much over the left-hand side of this diagram. As you go over to the right, it's starting to dominate the reactivity of this species. Um, the upshot of this is that you can't really use a, a straightforward Arrhenius-type expression to explain the temperature dependence of any given reactive site in this molecule, you need to use one of these modified or three-parameter expressions in order to do so. And so you've got um, a lot of competition within channels, but you've also got, uh, sorry, within reactive sites, but you've also got competing reactions within channels. So, um, so this total rate coefficient over here is actually constructed of a summation of a bunch of other complex behaviors that all add up to give you the total rate constant over here, which is the summation of these three parameter expressions. And that basically leads to a complex product distribution. Um, anything circled in a, or, I don't know, in squared, it's like, it's, it's got a rectangle around it, but anything with a rectangle around it is a diagnostic product of a certain reaction channel. Uh, and I don't want to bore you with this atmospheric, well, this organic chemistry just yet, but um, I will bore you with it later. But I just wanted to talk about the fact that um, this is ibutanol. It's not a particularly complicated molecule. We have observed much more complicated molecules in the atmosphere. So I leave it up to you to, uh, to think about what such a complex mechanism might look like. Um, so. What is known experimentally? So I'm not going to talk about my new measurements without finding out what people have already done. So this is another Arrhenius diagram, log of the rate coefficient versus inverse temperature. Um, it's got a negative temperature dependence, as you can see. So as temperature goes down, the reaction rate goes up. And what you can see is that you've got some slight evidence of non-Arrhenius behavior, which basically means that you've got curvature in the Arrhenius diagram. Which is, uh, which is because you've got contributions from different reaction mechanisms happening over a fairly short temperature range. Um, you can also note that the, uh, the literature agreement is rather good for this particular reaction, so the rate coefficient is um, pretty well constrained. Uh, we've also got some high temperature data that we can look at. This shows um, that you've actually got a really contrasting mechanism at high temperature. So in the combustion temperature range, um, you've basically got this positive temperature dependence, which is uh, more attributable to a direct abstraction channel with a high activation energy. So, um, so in our atmospheric range over here, this is where our complex forming is happening. 
And then you can obviously uh, create a nice parameterization across the whole temperature range because we know the, uh, the rate coefficient over a, a very broad uh, temperature range. So um, we do have a third piece of information here, and that is that uh, we have product yields. Product yields are useful in telling us exactly what this rate coefficient is composed of. So it's all very well to say how fast something reacts, but if you don't know what it's making, then, uh, then it's pointless. Um, so we have this, uh, this one single product study available in the literature, which tells us that, um, that actually uh, the reactivity of the beta side should be roughly 61% plus or minus four. Um, the problem with that is that uh, it's not very reliable so we, in fact, as far as the state of the literature is concerned, we know how fast it reacts, but we just don't know what it makes when it gets out into the atmosphere. But I quite like that idea of the, um, of the product yield. So if we take that forward a little bit, um, here's our organic chemistry again. As you can see, um, if you could attribute a given, uh, a given product to a given partial reaction rate or a given reaction channel, then you could, uh, in principle, um, back out what the, uh, what the contribution is to that overall rate constant. And so we've got some unique products here. We've got isobutyraldehyde, we've got acetone, and we've got acetaldehyde over here. And you don't really need to care about that minor channel down there because the hydroxyl OH does not contribute very much. So how am I going to measure all these products? So, um, so I enlisted the help of Jeff and John with their um, temperature controlled chamber, which is a really unique facility that allowed me to measure this reaction rate from 251 to 340 Kelvin. Um, we did some gentle photolysis of our OH precursors with a, a filtered uh, xenon arc lamp. Um, which, uh, so our OH precursors were methyl nitride and isopropyl nitride. That was, uh, that was how we were producing OH in our system. We have an in-situ FTIR spectrometer with a 32.6 meter path length. And we uh, used a multi-analytical approach here by also employing a GCFID side by side, which turned out to be really handy actually in diagnosing some of our, uh, some of our early problems. So if I uh, look at what our isobutyraldehyde yield was doing, this is basically when the, uh, when the molecule reacts, it makes, uh, when it abstracts the hydrogen site from the alpha channel, it makes this radical here, this alpha hydroxyalkyl radical, which reacts with O2, giving you HO2 in a prompt um, isobutyraldehyde molecule. And basically, if you can count up how much of this you make versus how much of your alcohol you destroyed, you can determine what the molar yield of that particular reactive channel is, that beta reactive channel. And so in principle, that's how it should work. In practice, what happens is because isobutyraldehyde is really quite reactive, it's hanging around in the chamber, OH is there, it's going to react with OH. So you basically, this is the observation over here in this, uh, this green ellipse, you see this, uh, this black trace it's rolling over as, uh, as you start to consume more and more of your butanol. And um, you can linearize this by this uh, nifty little analytical expression that's at the top here, which basically tells you um, how, much, uh, how much of your isobutyraldehyde you lost. So you need to linearize that problem if you want to get your yield back out. And that goes from 34% to 47% as you increase the temperature from 251 Kelvin to 340 Kelvin. So if we take a look at the beta channel, that's making acetone for us. So we start with this radical here. We've abstracted the beta hydrogen. We add an O2 to make a peroxy radical. That does an NO2 to NO, NO to NO2 conversion, giving you a chemically activated alkoxy, which falls apart before it can react with O2 gives you a formaldehyde and acetone. Um, it's basically very stable. Acetone isn't very reactive towards OH, so it hangs around in the chamber pretty well. And, um, and it actually has the opposite problem. 
of, uh, of isobutyraldehyde in that it is formed in a secondary sense rather than consumed. So we actually have to correct this yield down. So we start with, say, this black trace here, which is our observation, and we've got to correct it down because we've made it when we consumed our isobutyraldehyde from the last slide. So when you do all your corrections, you end up uh, moving from 58% to 37% as you decrease the temperature down from 251 to 340 Kelvin. So finally, this is the last bit of organic chemistry I think I'm going to show you. Um, this is uh, the reactivity on the gamma reaction channel. So this is a much more complicated uh, mechanism. You need to go through two uh, separate peroxy radicals. You need to do two NO to NO2 conversions and two chemically activated alkoxy radicals before you eventually arrive at the acetaldehyde that you care about. Um, it needs to be corrected for secondary consumption because it is quite reactive, but it also needs to be corrected for secondary production since it is quite a common oxidation product. So once you've applied your, your modeling and your corrections, you go from about 8% at 251 Kelvin all the way up to 16% as you increase the temperature up to 340 Kelvin. All right, so finally um, we arrive at a solution to this, uh, this summation here. So we finally have a parameterization, so I think we need a drum roll here, but there's, there's no drummers around, so we'll, um, there we go. So. Um, so yeah, basically you got, um, you've got our nice temperature dependent uh, product studies that we can then apply to an overall parameterization of the total rate constant and taking in, into account every bit of kinemic, uh, kinetic information that I have at my disposal to produce this, uh, this number that is consistent with, um, with all of our observations. So that's um, that kind of concludes this part of the, uh, the talk. But I do want to uh, just mention that this is uh, basically quite difficult. We do have um, some uncertainties here, and it's hard for us to extrapolate outside of the temperature range that there is available in Jeff and John's chamber. So, um, so I do offer this, um, this equation at, uh, with a caveat that it is quite difficult, and it's very difficult to extrapolate. Okay, so I'm going to just give you a couple of slides on the potential drawbacks of atmospheric chemistry. Um, I've put atmospheric chemistry in quotation marks here because this is the atmospheric chemistry approach. This is using NOx, using OH, using all these uh, vital ingredients that keep the, uh, the production of tropospheric ozone ticking along, um, but it might not necessarily be atmospherically relevant conditions. Um, so in our case, we have, uh, we have problems with high NOx. Um, and what, what that can lead to, as well as other things, is um, we can get some of these interesting nitrization reactions going on, which are um, when your alcohol exchanges its functional group in a ligand switching mechanism to give you uh, this isobutyl um, nitride. Um, it can do that by actually exchanging with your nitrite precursors, which is basically the, uh, the starting point of OH in this system. Or it can also react with NO2 to give you the same product. Um, this turned out to be a fundamental problem in, in our um, product studies, and we needed to take account of that stuff. Um, the other thing is we got so much NOx, uh, if we drop down the temperature, then we start to get involved in this terrible... Um, nitrogen uh, cycle, which, uh, which does give you some problems and you do need to do a little bit of modeling to back out what your fundamental product yield actually is. And then another uh, problem with atmospheric chemistry is that it's pretty hard to switch off. So you start from having a stable end product or what you would normally think of as a stable end product, such as isobutyraldehyde, and you start reacting it away. And then we, of, of course, need to correct such data to get it back into a linear form. Um, 
But you've also got the, the inverse problem. You've got a convergent uh, product distribution, which basically means that you're, you're having a product that you can make from several sources. So that gives you a, pr uh, a problem of apportioning those sources. Um, so eventually everything ends up as CO2 and H2O somewhere down the line. And you also obviously have a lot of um, less than diagnostic products throughout the oxidation steps. So it can sometimes be quite difficult to, uh, to find a smoking gun in atmospheric chemistry. Um, all right, so I'm going to move on to a new venture. This is a slightly different approach. This is Project HOMA. We are encouraged to have acronyms um, in our European projects. So this is hydrocarbon oxidation mechanisms elucidated from radical scavenging. So the idea is uh, basically to extend some recent work where we're able to sca uh, scavenge um, carbon centered radicals uh, and turn them into stable halides that we could then quantify later. Um, a simple reaction would look something like this. You have OH plus a hydrocarbon. That goes on to make a propyl or well, an alkyl radical. This alkyl reacts with a halogen of your choosing to give you a, uh, a halide plus an atomic halide, uh, uh, atomic halogen, sorry. Um, this, is, this requires a lot of tight control over the, uh, over the chemistry. And it's uh, also an interdisciplinary project, so sorry if this isn't very visible. I'll try my best. Uh, so it's basically, we've got three major components to the study. One is analytical chemistry, which is basically I'm taking the, uh, the expertise of a lot of our field workers over in the University of Bristol. I'm able to employ um, sensitive GC techniques, micro trap based pre-concentration, really accurate calibrations, things like that. We've got another component, which is um, the modeling side of this. So we need explicit um, modeling of, um, of the reactor chemistry. And we also need to model the results once we've achieved these uh, our other objectives in this study. Um, and then we also have our photochemistry, which takes um, makes use of the uh, various expertise of generating radicals in, in a controlled way. And so I think none of these uh, individually are particularly um, original, but the overlap of the three here, I think, is the original component of this particular study. All right, so I'm going to, I'm not going to go through every one of these details, that would be torture. Um, but I will, uh, this, this is a mental map of how I uh, see uh, solving this, uh, this multifaceted problem. Of <laughs> and um, I don't want to go into any of the details, but I, I do want to put across the fact that there are basically several different um, components that need to work together in a good way. Otherwise, I'm not going to end up with a uh, successful experiment. I want to be over here. So, um, so obviously I need very pure gases, I need to get the chemistry to work properly, so I need good modeling. I need to do some, uh, some optimization of our instrumentation. And there is, of course, uh, an optical component to this. So this is a schematic of, uh, of the apparatus. So uh, it's very simple. It's essentially, um, we start with, uh, with flowing our reactants together in a mixing volume, we then introduce these gases into a flowing reactor where we photolyze it with a 193 nanometer eczema pulse. That kicks off our chemistry, so we start making OH radicals at this point. We allow those to react with uh, our alkane of choosing, and it is quite a diverse method. And then, um, and then we quench out all our chemistry with this, uh, this injector of bromine. That basically converts these alkyl radicals into something that isn't going to do anything else for a while. And then we uh, flow it into our cold trap, which is a network of cold traps uh, operated in parallel to increase the throughput. And, uh, and then off to our dry scroll pump. So we'll take this part of the apparatus off to our offline analysis, where we'll be measuring these halides with a, uh, a gas chromatograph. 
So here are some of the key features of, uh, of the apparatus. So we're going to generate quite low radical concentrations. Uh, so roughly 1 times 10 to the 10, which is still not low by atmospheric uh, standards, but it's pretty low for, um, for laboratory standards. Uh, the reason I keep them low is that alkyl-alkyl reactions are incredibly fast. So if you increase the temperature of the, uh, the concentration of the radicals, they will basically self-react and kill all your chemistry off. Um, then we, because we've got such low radical concentrations, we can only make as many halides as we make radicals. So we need a really sensitive instrument to measure those halides coming off. And for this, I've chosen a twin-linked GCECD, an NICI GCMS, and um, these have both got sub-PPT detection limits for, um, for the bromides that I'm interested in. Um, I'm also waging war on uh, elastomers in my apparatus. So anything containing elastomer is essentially a source of oxygen, which is going to kill my experiment. It will also be a source of a background of halide, which I'm not interested in measuring. So I'm basically replacing elastomers wherever possible with these welded assemblies and graded seals. Um, I'll be uh, able to clean and purify my reactor to a large extent by, uh, by baking it out and also by turbo pumping on it. And I calculate that I can get my uh, outgassing down to about 5 times 10 to the minus 11 tor liter per second per square centimeter, which um, with the sort of uh, surface areas that I'm considering uh, should give me roughly 100 ppt of outgassing stuff. Um, and then I've got uh, event, uh, high purity gases which aren't nominally pure enough, so I will be putting them through gas purifiers to get the oxygen down to a satisfactory 100 ppt. And then, of course, I'll be using a parallel network of cold traps in order to achieve high throughput. So I want to be able to send as much stuff through these cold traps as possible. That will give me a high duty cycle. So for every laser pulse, I'll be able to get my halides, and that will achieve a high sensitivity. Um, so. I've just got this uh, this highlighted area. I'm going to just zoom in on that uh, that part of the reactor. And you, this is where all the action is happening. So um, so radicals are initiated when we photolyze N2O, yielding an O singlet D and a nitrogen molecule. That O singlet D reacts with water, giving two OHs. And that's our time zero in our experiment. We allow the gas to flow to the right here, and uh, that's where our oxidation is happening. So OH plus our alkane is giving alkyl radicals plus water at this point. And this is where we scavenge. We introduce Br2 instantly to give um, our alkyl halide. And that's what we want to measure in our GC ECD, if you remember. Um, so this is a modeled output of what I expect to see in my reactor. So I've got this, an even more schematic schematic on the top here. Got our laser uh, pulse, which is uh, just representing time zero. We're initiating OH chemistry at this point. We've got our bromine injector right there. And if we look at our model, so this is, uh, this is concentration on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. Um, so if we look at our model, we're up at about 1.4 times 10 to the 10 molecules per cubic centimeter. It rapidly drops off as we allow it to react with uh, C, uh, C3H8 propane. And at the same time, we're seeing the, uh, the propyl radicals grow in. So propane produces two unique propyl radicals. It makes isopropyl and n-propyl. And once these uh, concentrations plateau, we've basically increased these to the maximum amount. That's when we uh, consume them with bromine to convert them efficiently into uh, our halide. And then that's off to offline analysis. 
And there we are. There's our chemistry. So that's our radical initiation zone. This is our reaction zone. And that's where we're making our analyte. And so if you look at this equation here, if we can quantify what the ratio of one halide versus another is, then we should be able to back out what the contribution of one reactive site is to another. So it's a really direct way of, uh, of elucidating our first oxidation mechanism in propane. Um, O2 could really spoil this experiment. So, um, so I've included some models of, uh, of what happens when we start to ramp up the O2 concentration. So if you look at um, when it's down at a 1 ppb level, um, everything's fine. Um, you, you tend to find that the, uh, the traces almost overlap, so we're not really consuming any of our alkyl if we can keep our concentrations down at about a ppb of oxygen. But if it is allowed to go up to a ppm, for instance, and you can see that we've really spoiled our, our experiment, we're not going to be able to quantify these things in any sort of way. So that basically underscores the need, really, for a very good reactor design, uh, good pumping, good um, a total reduction in elastomers, um, and also uh, very pure gases and the possibility of purifying those gases even further. So um, this is this technique does have some weaknesses. One of them is that it's not a time resolved measurement. So by the time something's gone wrong, we don't necessarily know what went wrong, except that we didn't make the halide that we were interested in. So, um, so for that reason, we need to build up a suite of diagnostics. Here's an example of one, which will be the um, CF3I chemical actinometer, which basically will tell you how many radicals you've got in the system. So going back to that slide real quick, can we really constrain how many of these things we're really making? Um, the actinometer should be able to tell us that. And it should also be able to tell us how the actual workings of our flow tube system uh, is actually performing. So, um, so is the gas mixing working correctly? We can compare that with, uh, with a well-mixed sample versus an online mixed sample. All right, so here are my conclusions. Um, so I took all available kinetic information to give a parameterization of, a, uh, of ibutanol plus OH, which, uh, which tells us what it does in the atmosphere of a really large temperature range. Um, it's a really difficult experiment to perform, and it's also a difficult experiment to analyze. And there are some errors associated with this analysis. So, um, so it is important to, uh, to acknowledge that fact. And in light of that, I've been looking at some possible alternatives of different apparatuses. I don't know if that's the plural of apparatus, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, yeah, and different techniques for, for measuring the same thing, just using a different route to doing that. So here are my acknowledgments. I'll just leave those up. So any questions for Max? And remember, we'll be passing the microphone around. We are being recorded and broadcasting live to Ascension Island, for example. Hi, Becky. <laughs> John Ortega. I was wondering how your, um, the, the, the different contributions to the total reactivity compared to what you would predict with structural activity relationships, like from Quack and Atkinson's work? OK. Um, so Quack and Atkinson don't do an especially good job of, uh, of predicting the contributions to alcohol reagents. So, um, so as one of the specific weaknesses of the technique, and they did actually update that particular SAR for, um, for alcohols and for multifunctional kind of uh, carbonyl like alcohol species. And um, so I think that's Bethyl et al. 
And um, even so, even with this, uh, it's not particularly good at predicting the rates of, um, of alcohol mechanisms. Um, and one, one other question. You, you had a technique up there. I just wasn't familiar with it. It was something NIMS, okay, GC, yeah. something like you know, So the NICI uh, GCMS is uh, negative ion chemical ionization. So it's just a really uh, long acronym, probably unnecessarily long. Um, so big picture, what does this say about this pathway versus doing if you had standard gasoline as far as sort of the production and then how might it apply to other, where does this fit into other potential biofuels? So I think big picture wise, um, this particular compound is, a, um, is an acetone producing machine. So uh, if you make acetone from the beta channel, which you do overall in, uh, in the majority of cases in the uh, atmospheric temperature range, then you've got direct acetone production. But also if you make isobutyraldehyde, it also goes on to make acetone later on. So it depends a little bit on whether you're scavenging those uh, those decay products of the isobutyraldehyde as to whether you make acetone directly or you start to hold on to it in the form of pan. Um, so big picture, I think that a lot of gasoline formation is probably likely to give you a lot more carbon ions, which are potentially more reactive. So I think you'd get a lot more long-range transport of uh, some of your um, some of your emissions from ibutanol chemistry. Well, what about the higher reactivity in general? I mean, if it's 1 times 10 to the minus 11, it means you potentially make more ozone closer to cities. Um, actually, uh, so when you, make, uh, when you make ozone, you know, with a standard POCP kind of approach of looking at that problem, um, it requires that you do have reactive products. So if you start making a bunch of acetone, then I would say that you're not making too much uh, ozone too near the source. Sasha. How easily or complicated would it be to extend this to other functional groups in addition to the hydroxy, especially nitrate or, or uh, peroxide groups? So are we talking uh, with the conventional methodology or for my... Uh, your, your methodology in which you use okay. the halogens to essentially so, cut off the reactions. So I could say uh, it may be more conducive to es essentially things that you'd have a better time getting through a GC column. So your peroxides might suffer. Um, the nitrates should be okay. Um, but there are, of course, other scavengers you could use. I just chose bromine as one possible example. So you could also potentially um, give hydrogen back where you need to, or uh, or add NO, for instance. So there are um, there are a number of different um, scavengers that you could apply if it wasn't conducive to the functional group of your choosing. Any other questions? If not, let's thank Max again.